Good morning and welcome to ULTDC, United Lodge of Theosophies. <coughs> Meet on Sundays all over the world. Um, at this time, uh, the lodge is closed because of the condition we are in all over the world. Um, we are hoping that soon uh, our environment will be more stable and we will be able to meet in person again. The ULT um, stays with the mainline theosophy, uh, which was brought out uh, in the 19th century by HPB, Mr. Judge, and later on continued uh, on with um, Robert Crosby. These writings are essential to humanity's well-being in the future as well as today. So it is necessary that they be available to all those who are seeking for it. The Declaration. The policy of this lodge is independent devotion to the cause of theosophy without professing attachment to any theosophical organization. It is loyal to the great founders of the theosophical movement but does not concern itself with dissensions or differences of individual opinion. The work it has on hand and the end it keeps view are too absorbing and too lofty to leave it the time or inclination to take part in side issues. That work and that end is the dissemination of the fundamental principles of theosophy and the exemplification in practice of those principles through a truer realization of the self, a profounder conviction of universal brotherhood. It holds that the unassailable basis for union among theosophists, wherever and however situated, is similarity of aim, purpose, and teaching, and therefore has neither constitution bylaws nor officers, the sole bond between its associates being that basis, and it aims to disseminate this idea among theosophists in the furtherance of unity. It regards as theosophists all who are engaged in the true service of humanity without distinction of race, creed, sex, condition and organization and it welcomes to its association all those who are in accord with its declared purposes and who desire to fit themselves by study and otherwise to be the better able to help and teach others. The true theosophies belongs to no cult or sect, yet belongs to each and all. The following is a um, form signed by associates of the United Lodge of Theosophies. Being in sympathy with the purposes of this lodge as set forth in its declaration, I hereby record my desire to be enrolled as an associate, it being understood that such association calls for no obligation on my part other than that which I myself determine. Today's um, reading comes from the Bhagavad Gita. Thus before thee has been set the opinion in accordance with the Sankhya doctrine, speculatively, not hear what it is in practical devotional one, by means of which, if fully imbued therewith, thou shalt forever burst the bonds of karma and rise above them. In this system of yoga, no, of, no effort is wasted, nor are there any evil consequences. And even a little of this practice delivereth a man from great risk. In this path, there is only one single object, and this of a steady, constant nature. But widely branched is the faith, and infinite are the objects of those who follow not this system. The unwise, delighting in the controversies of the Vedas, tainted with worldly lusts, and preferring 
a transient enjoyment of heaven to eternal absorption, whilst they declare there is no other reward, pronounce for the attainment of worldly riches and enjoyments, flowery sentences which promise rewards in future births for present action, ordaining also many special ceremonies, the fruit of which is merit, leading to power and objects of enjoyment. But those who thus desire riches and enjoyment have no certainty of soul and least hold on meditation. The subject of the Vedas is the assemblage of the three qualities. Be thou free from these qualities, O Arjuna. Be free from the pairs of opposite and constant in the quality of sattva. Free from worldly anxiety and the desire to preserve present possessions. Self-centered and uncontrolled by objects of mind or sense. As many benefits as there are in a tank stretching free on all sides, so many are there for a true truth realizing Brahman in all the Vedic rites. Now today's talk, Mind of the Age. Thank you. Welcome friends. H.P. Blavatsky asserted many times that every theosophist, in order to merit the name, will have to be continually open-minded in recognition of the fact that every human impulse and tendency is a part of himself. The third fundamental proposition of the Theosophical Philosophy, as outlined in the Secret Doctrine, gives a philosophical basis for this perception. All beings either have passed or will pass through all experiences, and therefore through all psychological states. The fundamental object of human life being to learn how to participate in the conditions of any and all beings on earth. Prejudices and distinctions, even those apparently quite virtuous, serve as a barrier against communication with others who are no less souls than ourselves. To understand the mind of the age is to understand our own minds. Everyone has some inner desire to live a nobler and more inspiring life. We are never too far from our brothers, be they Catholics, spiritualists, or materialists. From the Buddha of India are said to have come the words, quote, I am as all these people, close quote. To what Walt Whitman the most apparently depraved of all Earth's creatures were still close to his mind and heart. The impulsion transmitted by HPV was directed towards a reclamation of moral idealism from the confused tangle of materialized religious and social customs. Today's youth are searching for principles to live by but too often are repulsed by the thought of religion. To revive a pure concept of religion, and therefore to reform and improve the social attitudes built upon narrow forms of religion were among HPV's chief focal points of concentration. Our inner desire to live a nobler and more inspiring life conflicts with the human characteristic to be at least better than some people. But our genuine inner voice recognizes in the example of Jesus as a light on the path of soul, which leads us to the conclusion 
that there must be something more important than the earthly life we know. The Theosophical Movement offered a rational basis for the re-examination of such questions as man's divine origin and immortality. To those whose genuine religious sense was strong, upon these matters rested the significance of morality. If a man were the casually constructed animal, which science seemed to seemed in, intent upon proving he was, or then morality was nothing but social expedience. Not only was the new science materialistic and amoral, but the habits of thought and action generated by secularized religion tended in much the same direction. From all sides pours the psychic forces generated by those who are trying to prove their doubtful moral worth by claiming that others were more mistaken than they were. Some of these crowded under the banner of science, others professed allegiance to religion, while, as is always the case of the thoughtful and unprejudiced, real scientists and those consecrated to a genuine, genuine religious life stood apart. With this modded basis, the morality, the, with this modded basis for morality, the claws of empire have grown sharper. The ambitious for domination of world trade have clashed more stridently, and the weapons of war have become more terrible. As the world population has increased, this has happened. Huge conflicts, as predicted by HBB, were inevitable. A densely populated world cannot indulge in the emotions of greed, prejudice, and fear without serious consequences. If a man's relation to his fellows was that of an animal creature whose only hope was to bite first that he be not bitten, or a creature of God who must wash away his own guilt by crushing his inferiors, the story could be written only in the ink of blood. This was the grim fate of this dark age of Kali Yuga. The intensification of all the externally feared forces which move people. So that finally the consequences of callous and brutal thinking would come to the fruition demanded by natural law. The seeds of more war were sown. People took physical might as a sign of divine grace and concentrated their source of power. Then came the spark and the explosion, the catastrophe originally caused by a degrading psychology. The significance of the individual man's sense of justice and his right to independence choice of action were engulfed in mass movements for power. Individual freedom has fought a losing battle. At a time when no clear basis remained for believing the individual man to be important. This was the setting for one of the most pressing dilemmas of modern man. Today people in all countries tend to move as the automations, caught up in organizations devised to gain and hold power. Most of us wish, perhaps without knowing it, for that basis for a belief in moral man, which the specifics of, theos uh, of theosophy provide. Fear of a world which apparently cannot be trusted is not a helpful background for efforts at quiet self-discipline. There is really no such thing as social morality. All morality is personal, although morality is currently 
thought out in terms of laws and accepted customs. The central theme of Plato's Republic is the difference between the way of thinking represented by Socrates and that of uh, Trismegistus. Men in general have since adopted the posi position of Trismegistus that if, so if society thinks one to be virtuous, that is all that is necessary. Washington, Jefferson, Payne believed in the reality, reality of soul and spirit. Reality of soul and spirit. So while the social planning of the founding fathers expected and encouraged the best for man, today's actions show that only the worst is really expected. Today we are principally devoted to finding ways of protecting ourselves from each other. We seem to think the smart thing is to know the laws of the jungle better than the other people do. This is a rude attitude in respect to morality. It encourages men to fight each other via class struggle, competitive business, war, and psychological conflicts in our relations. This brings us to the necessity of some practical philosophy which clarifies distinctions between vagrant desires and the needs of the soul and the real realization that the root and origin of every physical interrelationship is, in every case, mental and moral rather than physical. For many centuries, every feeling and impulse of the physical man was supposed to be evil. Today, each physical impulse is welcomed as a possible road to happiness. In theosophical terms, the realm of the senses can neither be good nor evil in itself, for good and evil pertain to the way man lives in the sensory world. One's actual behavior is never as dangerous as it is in the lack of faith in one's own moral strength and significance. Various religious pronouncements have made too many believe it impossible to live a life consecrated to a natural harmony between body and soul. Man is not an animal, but a god whose speech at times betrays his birth. That speech is motive, the language of the soul. Man's godly status resides in the fact that he can make motive supreme, can live according to the dictates of principle. Principles, as Plato taught, are godlike things. The man who seeks inner surety proceeds from the basis of a conviction of potential spiritual strength, whether that feeling be knowledge, intuition, or merely faith. Mahatma Gandhi reminds us that life is an aspiration. Its mission is to strive after perfection, which is self-realization. The, the ideal must not be lowered because of our weaknesses or imperfections. The victory is to those who are able to take and keep a firm attitude of mind. The materials for this grander outlook have been supplied. Let the aspirant search no further afield. Let him return to the source and origin of all search, the fundamentals of theosophy. Rules for progress. Let him resolve in mind and heart to salute and honor the eternal presence of the self in all men and all things. And let him resolve to cease finding fault, even with his own faults, knowing that all is divine justice. Let him resolve that his day-to-day -day program shall embody, if only a few precepts, of the Bhagavad Gita and the voice of the silence, 
quote we just heard from the first speaker for from from the Gita for even a little of this practice delivereth one from great risk. A distinguishing characteristic of the philosopher is that he never experiences a crisis. Crises do not arise from events. They are produced by human feelings. Both the feelings of hopes and fears spring from ignorance. The sage watches the operation of the law of cycles unmoved. Those who are wise in spiritual things grieve neither for the dead nor the living. To know the law of cycle, cycles means to remain, remain undisturbed by anything that may come to pass. Right choices cannot be made except when the mind is free from the pressure of external events. In order to prevent a thing, we must understand it. We cannot understand it while we hate or fear it. We are not to love vice, but are to recognize that it is a part of the whole. And trying to understand it, we thus get above it. The events we are for come to us under karma because of the attraction of opposites. If we hate anything, it seizes on, a, on our inner selves by reason of the stronger horror we feel for it. Only knowledge of cycles can emancipate us from the attachments which endow the events of life with their good and evil aspects. That is why philosophers always teach the doctrine of cycles. We must try to understand ourselves and our connections with the past. If we do not understand ourselves and our connections with the past, then it is certain that we will misunderstand the present, falsely assign causes, and ignorantly appraise remedies. Freedom is a discipline of the mind, not something won or the canon. Nor can canon ever destroy what the soul has truly wrought. Modern man floats in the backwash of the two great materialisms, religious and scientific. Every known religion has been based upon some idea of the dual nature of man. The Christian moralist hopes to escape forever from the difficulties presented by the sensuous world by his entrance into heaven. The materialist hopes to be able someday to escape the superstition of conscience, for he considers conscience to be an irrational barrier to full enjoyment of sensory capabilities, a barrier erected by the fears and taboos of a moralistic religion. Neither alternative offers hope that conscience and the senses may be brought into harmony. While man must solve his own psychic problems before he can create a better society, it is important for him to recognize that all his personal dilemmas are interlocked. Shall we work to be useful to society or to acquire the largest possible amount of wealth so that we can buy anything we may desire. A modern psychiatrist has written that the neurotic is the natural child of our culture. He is told both to acquire for himself and to sacrifice for humankind. Alternating from one position to the other, he develops a split personality. And if he is an extremely sensitive person, he may become psychotic. The greater capacity for responding to either the moral or the sensuous world, the more completely will a man throw himself in one or the other direction. Yet in so doing, he will be haunted by the world he left behind. There's no answer 
save that man is on a pilgrimage of soul, a journey through the conditions of the sensory world. This world he needs as the medium through which he can communicate with and learn from the soul beings like himself. But the point of orientation must be the self-realization of soul. The great men of history were those who integrated their lives around a conception of soul, soul destiny and purpose, and who were therefore able to will one thing. If this orientation is achieved, uh, the man has ground upon which he can stand. The world of the senses is still to be used, but used selectively according to what it may provide of lasting benefit for souls. Without a conviction of the real and primary existence of the soul, the faith for its realization cannot be found. Every religion, of course, is founded upon a belief in the superiority of certain states of feelings or emotions. Religion may easily be distinguished from philosophy by this definition. Also, for philosophy does not concern itself with the attainment of emotional states, but instead with what purposive use is to be made of them. Life is an unfoldment, and the further we travel, the more truth we can comprehend. <coughs> to understand the things that are at our door is the best preparation for understanding those <coughs> that lie beyond. Hypatia of Alexandria, the last Neoplatonist, says this. There are many indications that the power of a man becoming so great that he really can be what he wishes to be, even if he wants to be less than a man. There are many indications that the power of man becoming so great that he really can be what he wants to be, even if he wants to be less than a man, are with us. Today, with population almost everywhere on the increase, masses of people are continuously being rendered superfluous by political, social, and economic events, and to be blinded to all values apart from those of commercial, religious, and political propaganda. The real destruction is not by atom bombs and other horrors committed by man. Final destruction is death of the soul. The psychological atmosphere surrounding a conviction of man's essential depravity impels us to expect the worst from our fellow men, however much we may say we hope to have the best. As nations, men have habitually armed themselves to the teeth, hoping that their neighbors will not precipitate warfare, yet convinced that they must not expect too much of goodwill and brotherhood even from across the street. In India, this is apparently not so. Their tradition is that of pantheists, trying to love and understand every form of life and energy. Pantheists have not felt obliged to fear the works of the devil, nor to accept the fact that man is an evolved animal. Pantheism is associated with trust and reverence for nature and man. When the Hindus accept the spirituality of nature, rather than proclaiming its depravity, they lay a solid foundation for brotherhood. The Indians might tell us that our blasphemy, like the Nazi ones, arose from an idolatrous worship of the techniques of science divorced from any ethical goals and against the pantheon sense of citizenship in nature that we consider a childish foible. At the same time, we share this pantheistic sense in our hearts. It has been asserted that the Western peoples are on the path of destroying themselves. 
aided by a study of Indian scriptures like the Bhagavad Gita, the Hindus may be more successful than we are at disassociating their feelings about a human being from their feelings about his ideas. This makes the Hindus emotionally able to compromise without compromising principles. The reconciliation seems to lie not in the rejection of worldly participation, but in the renunciation of selfish gains. Not in the avoidance of struggles, but by preserving inner serenity while engaged in struggle. Not in the refusal of combat, but in refusing to hate the adversary one opposes. There is no valid distinction between public and private acts. And for Gandhi, the philosophy of nonviolence was a constant incentive to direct personal action. For help all you can on the big things, but do little things yourself, close quotes said Gandhi. Gandhi's genius, perhaps, was his ability to choose the small, literal acts, which has a great symbolical meaning the one which generates soul force in the person who makes it at the same time that it contributes to achieving a tangible result. In combating an almost universal pessimism in respect to man's moral potentialities, the acceptance of dogmas cannot be explained away as we rationalize that our intellectual, political, and religious leaders control us by pushing our underlying selfishness, our fear, and our greed buttons. All who wish to discover <coughs> where our personal and societal wrongness lies must puzzle out the extent of rightness underlying each extreme position. There is no error, wrote HPV save that which arises from a partial truth. There is no evil which does not have a mysterious connection with a potential good. So it must be with the desire of man to find security through the establishment of some pattern of living. Buddha encouraged his listeners to first discover wherein their own good lay, <coughs> and the rest of his message enjoined his disciples to extend the search for goodness so calmly and clearly that it reveal the essential promise <coughs> of every other living being. The expectation of the worst in human relationships is our worst human prejudice. Before we can expect others to be honest and just, we must come to feel <coughs> that it is possible for us to be honest and just. If we are dominant, dominantly conditioned by ideals of original sin or innate ancestry, we cannot manage to be fair and just in any true and consistent sense. So if our lineage is a spiritual and moral one, we can expect ourselves to be capable of fairness <coughs> and integrity. And if we misrepresent anything of our real estimation, of another during immediate contact, we are dishonest. Without honesty, there can be nothing more than pessimism and negativism. And no, more, no one has the courage for honesty unless he feels within himself and in others the existence of soul. This is a philosophical contribution to the problem of overcoming the deep psychological despair <coughs> of our time. We're going to close here. Thank you for joining us and take care.